Everyone doing well? Yeah. All right, stay in online community, welcome. For those watching online, we are taking communion, so if you can go somewhere in your kitchen and find some elements for communion, we'll give you time to do that. Everyone in the service, show me your smiley faces. Everyone good? The worship team's really good? So that's good. We need them on their A game for this. All right. In Deuteronomy 10, it says this, He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. Father, we just thank you that you're a God of miracles, that you are the same today, yesterday, and forever. Father, I just ask that we encounter your love and grace right now. Transform us from the inside out, Father. We just thank you so much. May we be in tune with you and worship you with everything we have. In Jesus' name, and God's people said? Amen. All right, give your neighbor a high five.
silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear.
believe in you you're the god of miracles keep that in your spirit oh i believe in you i believe in you you're the god of miracles of communion. And so to facilitate that, if you'd be seated, and if you did not pick up one of our new communion packets, these are a different style. We believe it's a, a step up. Please just lift your hand up and one of our ushers will serve you. Make sure you take one of these. Communion, for those of you, and again, as you're, if you're online, this is a great opportunity for you to grab some bread and juice. But communion is one of the two oldest sacraments of the church. Uh, the other being 
the sacrament of baptism, water baptism, and we'll be we'll be having a water baptism service in a in a few weeks or months. But communion has been a part of the church for as long as there has been a church, and there's a number of different traditions and methods of receiving communion. But the thing that is universal to all traditions is that communion represents a relationship. Now. There's nothing supernatural about this gluten-free cracker and this little bit of juice that I hold in my hand and you hold in yours. But the relationship that they represent is extremely special. It's a relationship that says that I can be righteous despite what I have done or what I will do. It's a righteousness that is a free gift of God. And all we have to do is simply say, Lord, have mercy on me. And we receive that grace to be made whole and righteous. It is a relationship that comes with healing. Jesus was explicit that by his stripes we are healed. The apostle James said that if anyone is is sick in body, let him ask of the elders and they'll pray for them. And the, the prayer of faith will lift up a man or a woman or a child. If you have need of healing. And it is symbolic or representative of the fact that we are part of one family, that we all have individual names. I'm a Bowling, you're a Garcia, you're, you're a whatever. And we have our, our, our biological families, but we also have our spiritual families and we are brothers and sisters. We are one family in Christ and we universally receive communion in all traditions because that's what God wants to break down barriers and to help us here at this place become a diverse community of people who worship God together, seeking God together, and share Jesus and love to our city and world. So with that in mind, I'd like to ask us all to look at the screens or the television or the computer you're looking at, and I want to just have us say this passage together, if we would. This is 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 4. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Let us make this affirmation of faith. By faith, I partake of the body of Christ and participate in the life that he calls me to. All you have to do with this new, you'll see there's two sides. Lift up the cracker side, peel off the top. This is gluten-free for those of you who didn't know. Let us eat together. Thank you, Father. The next verse is verse 25 and it says this and if you would repeat this with me in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this to remember me as often as you drink it let us make this confession as well by faith I partake of the blood of Christ and the forgiveness it brings Now be careful as you peel this back, make sure it's pointed away from you. Are you ready? Then let us drink. Father, I thank you that we do this in remembrance of you. We receive your forgiveness. If you're watching online or you're here live and you need physical healing in your body or you have a loved one who needs healing, I encourage you right now, just by faith, say in Jesus' name, we receive healing for ourselves and our loved ones. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. And Lord, I thank you that we are one family in Christ Jesus. Amen. Across the sanctuary here, you'll see there's some buckets with liners, and you may drop off your uh, empty container in those. But for now, let us stand again and worship.
somebody and say, you know, hey, Jared, I'm so glad I'm a Christian. And if you're not, you don't have to. But I'm just so glad I'm a Christian. I'm glad that I made that decision so many years ago now. I've been a Christian longer than you've been alive, Jericho. Did you know that? (laughs) That's really, I don't know what that means. But we're so glad to have each and every one of you, those of you who are joining online, those of you who are here. And if you're a first-time visitor, we are so happy that you're coming to worship with us today. We, we pray that you really have a great experience with God today. And we pray that you come back and that uh, you make this your home church. We'd love to see you again. And those of you who are online, do not forget to like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's an ever-growing outreach, and we just are so happy that we can share our services across uh, geographic borders. And so that, that is so much fun. So God bless you all. Say hello to somebody again as you're seated. And uh, thank you again. Good job, worship team. Good job, everybody. How many of you are praying that Deshaun Watson comes to the Denver Broncos? Just curious to see that. Anybody? Uh, nobody? I'm sorry. Just thought I'd bring that up. That has nothing to do with God or, or the church. It's just, it does. Thank you. Thank you. We have at least one person who says, yes, it has to do with God. But it's, it's good. Go. <laughs> you know, my good friend Insel is, is a Miami Dolphin fan, and, and he's, he has mixed re, uh, who? Who was a who? Okay, we got at least two in the house. But uh, it, whoever you support, or if you support no one, uh, man, God loves diversity, and, and, and we tolerate everyone who's even wrong about who to root for. No, it's good. Uh, I don't know how I got down that path. Probably was not following the Holy Spirit, but now I will follow the Spirit. Is that It's an opportunity for us to, to worship through our giving. Uh, giving, you know, I mentioned that communion and water baptism were the two earliest sacraments of the church. But giving has been a part of the the body of Christ and prior to that, the Jewish tradition, literally for thousands of years. It's bringing an offering to God uh, in appreciation of of his blessings, of his his abundance that he sows into our lives in anticipation of the fact that he made some covenant promises with us. He said, though, as we sow, so will we reap. And that if we put the kingdom first, then we don't have to worry about all of these material things that seem to obsess everybody. But that, in fact, if we'll put the kingdom first, we can be free of the anxiety that seems to torment people because we'll have an assurance in our lives that that our Heavenly Father, who loves us tremendously, will not allow us to go without or to show uh, an ignorance of our needs. In fact, He knows our needs. Did you know that whatever you have need of, God knows about that? If you need money for rent, God knows about that. If you need money to repair your car, God knows about that. 
If you need money for, for a, whatever it is that you have a, a physical need for, the Lord is aware of that. And the way he told us to, to walk out of fear for that need was to worship him and to present that request to him with thanksgiving in our heart and a peace of God would come over us. So right now, before we receive the tithes and the offerings and the mission support of God's people, I just want you to lift up whatever financial needs you have. And everybody has a financial need, amen? I, I, don't, I, don't, I know very few people who don't have any financial needs. But, but Father, we as a family, we hold those up to you. Now, some people need to repair their car. Some people need a car. Some people need rent money, others utilities. Some people need tuition. Uh, some, Father, have medical bills that, that are, they're struggling to pay. Uh, God, some people have other issues going on that we don't even know about. But Lord, all of them have the same source for solution, and it's you. And we lift these needs up to you, and we say that by faith, we will not worry about them, but we will trust that you will meet those needs abundantly above and beyond what we can possibly think or ask in ways that we may not even understand. We believe our needs are met according to your abundance in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, as you're sowing, there's a number of ways to give. You can text to give at the number 28950. Just send the word encounter and follow the prompts. You can also go online at ecdenver.org and give that way. Or if you'd like to deposit a check or a credit card statement or something here uh, in the physical service, those buckets are in the front and in the back of this congregation. But if you would, go ahead and just let God lead you, and may God bless your giving in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A few other things before we transition to Pastor Sarah. Number one, I'm going away for a couple of days this week on a personal spiritual retreat. Haven't done this for several years. And really feel like the Lord led me to do this. And uh, a friend of mine had recommended a place down in Colorado Springs. So I just asked for your prayer. There's nothing really, you know, huge that I'm struggling with. But I really feel like as we come out of COVID and go into the, the post-COVID season, which is coming upon us, most of the experts I, I'm reading are saying that the numbers should drop by April or to June, somewhere in there to, to really low numbers. And we can begin to transition to a, the, the post-COVID season by faith in Jesus' name. Looking forward to that, God. <laughs> but I really feel I need to hear some specific things from the Lord. So just be in prayer. That'll be Wednesday and Thursday of this week. We also want to let you know that we've got some wonderful things coming up. Uh, we have got the Women's Charcuterie Night. And uh, if you don't know what a charcuterie is, because I did not the first time they did that, uh, that's a cheese and meat tray. And uh, it's just a much better word for it. So uh, that's a picture you'll see on the big screen. If you're a lady on Friday, February 26th, 7 p.m., uh, please come and enjoy charcuterie. Do they need to bring charcuterie? Is that... They do. They do need to bring something for it. That's very good. Also want to let you know that we are beginning a, uh, a food drive in the month of, of March and uh, that can canned or non-perishable foods will be collected at every service throughout the month. We will collect them here and then take them over to uh, Hope's Provision Food Bank that we partner with. And so we thank you ahead of time for that giving. And with that, I want to show one more video announcement. Hey family, this week is our week for Encounter Groups. Here at Encounter Church, we believe it is vital to our relationship with God to be in relationship with each other. We see this played out in the book of Acts where early Christians came together over a meal, dedicating themselves to each other, to the apostles' teaching, and to prayer. Our Encounter Groups replicate that same lifestyle. All week long throughout the city, we are meeting in homes to share a meal together, to fellowship with one another, discuss God's word, and pray for each other. If you're new to our church family, we wanna invite you to come be a part. And if you're already connected to a group, we look forward to seeing you again. All are welcome. And to find a group near you, you can visit ecdenver.org. You can check the flyer in the bulletin or sign up in the lobby. We can't wait to see you this week. Fancy meeting you all here today. Everybody happy? Right? And of course we want a joke. I was looking here, right? So this is a fantastic joke. It says, my doctor says that when you die, <laughs> your pupils are the last things to go because they dilate. <laughs> dilate, right? I know. Terry, that was good. It was a smile worthy. I mean, it was okay. I wasn't, you know, all that bad. <laughs> Totally glad to be with all of y'all today. And um, 
Reese, you know, kind of launched and felt uh, God was leading him to talk uh, theme thematically this year in terms of simplicity and influence. And uh, so I'm going to kind of leverage into that, but I'm also going to continue um, the series that I started, I don't know when, Conversations with Jesus, which I'm really kind of digging these conversations. As I dig into them, I find they dig into me. Um, and so thinking about these conversations, if you remember, Jesus had discussions, dialogue, with basically four groups of people. The first group we I identified when I just started the series, the renegades. Um, those are people who would be like sinners, you know, the ones that are tax collectors and drunkards and Jesus, the friend of sinners. Thank God. Anybody want to say yes and amen to that one? Yes and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Then we have the second group, which is called the reverent. Those would be the religious people, Pharisees, Sadducees, everybody who's doing it right and dotting the I's, crossing the T's, meticulous and reverent. Um, there's a good place for them. And good conversations that Jesus has with the reverent. Um, and some of them are a little hot and tense. You're like, how are you going to do that? I don't know. Make it up as we go. And another group that Jesus had conversations with were receivers. People who got miracles from him. Right? Bread, fish, healing, you know, get up off your mat. That kind of thing. Do you want to be well? So we got the receivers. But the last group that we're going to talk about, and we're going to emphasize this one today, is the relators. And these would be Jesus' disciples, his closest followers. And it's interesting because I think for most of us in the room online, um, I think we can identify with one of these four, maybe a couple of them. How many of you could say, yeah, yeah, I get it. And if you look in your life, maybe in hindsight, you were more one, more so than the other. But I know for myself, I want to be this, I want to be in this category the most of all. I want to be one of the closest followers. I'm going to push you out of the way so I can get there first. Because that's not really loving, but nevertheless, honest. <laughs> but I want to talk about this relator thing today. And I would invite you to flip in your Bibles to John chapter 2. We're going to look at a really interesting conversation between what I would consider maybe one of Jesus' um, original or one of the very first relators and this is a conversation Jesus has with his mom and I find that interesting because when I think of relators off the oh, right off the bat I always think you know Peter James John 12 disciples but when I think about if I if I identify relators as those who are his closest followers closest relationships I think his mom is going to fall in that category <laughs> she's going to know him really well right I mean she was with him from the very beginning hello like pregnant with him. She changed his diapers, right? She fed him. She cleaned up if he puked. I don't know. Did Jesus puke? I don't, she would know. She would know him better than any of his followers uh, just out of the, the time that she's been around. How many of you would agree with that? So I find it interesting because in John chapter 2, we're going to look at an interesting situation here because the first 12 verses are a wedding feast, now, when you go to a wedding feast, who participates in a wedding feast? Yeah, who are the main players? The bride and the groom, right? And the family. So then when you go to a wedding, it's about them. And if you're, you know, whether you're in the wedding party or you're just an attendee, everybody knows it's about the bride and the groom and the family, immediate family. We know that. But in this story... <laughs> I find it interesting because this story, the wedding is kind of the backdrop. And the main um, activity is basically between Jesus and his mom. And the wedding is kind of the backstory on which they have this conversation. Now, additionally, if you look in the first two verses, it says that Jesus was there. Thanks for putting those up. On the third day, there's a wedding at Cana of Galilee. That's a small town uh, a couple miles from Nazareth. The mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So his disciples, at this point, I'm not sure. I don't think you can say it definitively. Was it all 12 of them? All 12 of the disciples? Or... And in John 1, at the end of chapter 1, it says that Peter, James, Peter, Andrew, Nathaniel, and Philip 
had decided to follow Jesus. So they were newbies, newbies. They're on the road to relating. But I want you to appreciate that you have a group of mm, neophytes, newbies, wannabes. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll be the disciples. But they're not further down the road in the sense of fully developed or even close to the relationship that Mary has with Jesus. Are you tracking with me? They have the intentions because they signed up. Yep, we're going to be your disciples. We're going to be your closest followers. But how that plays out and how that develops and unfolds, this is just the beginning of that journey. And I would propose to you that Mary is more fully formed in that relating connection and knowing Jesus. So in this conversation, you have Mary talking with Jesus, and it's an interesting conversation, but I want to propose to you that the disciples were spectators. They had the intention of growing into a deeper relationship, but this was the beginning of their journey. And I would say for all of us in the room, everybody watching online, we are all, sorry for the camera work with all of you all having to like track me here, but it keeps you perky. That's not all bad. And thanks on behalf of the people watching the screen. Anyways, so all of us are on this journey. We're someplace beginning. Some of us are renegades. Some of us are reverent. Some of us are receivers. But I think if we, if we're, we would say, yeah, I want to be a relator. I want to be one of Jesus' closest followers. I want to grow in my relationship with him. We're all somewhere on that progression. And so I appreciate that you and I, we get to listen, eavesdrop, and kind of look into that conversation between Jesus and one of his closest relationships, his mom, right? And it's not like the, the conversation he had when he was 12, hey, how come you were looking for me? We lost the son of God. That's, you know, he's a 12-year-old man at that point. This is now a fully formed adult. He's a carpenter. He's on and beginning his ministry. So this conversation between Jesus and his mom, it shows us what it can look like to have a very deep relationship, vibrant, healthy, constructive, engaging conversation with Jesus. And so here's how the conversation unfolds. And I want to really accentuate this whole thing because it all revolves around a need. Mary comes to Jesus and says to him, hey, they have run out of wine. They've run out of wine. There's a need. And I want to point that out because on our journey from, from being a spectator and intentional to develop into a relator, we're going to go through times, experiences where we have needs. And some of us, we think needs are money. But need can be a whole spectrum of stuff, family. And need can be wisdom. Need can be health. Need can be uh, emotional stability. Need can be a job. Need can be time, <laughs> right? I mean, time. How many, how many could identify at least a couple needs you have now? You're like, yeah, I need you to be quiet so we can get on with, the, with my dad to go grocery shopping, clean the house, and just, <laughs> I get it, I get it. But need, need is important. And so when Mary points this out to Jesus, I would say it's an invitation. It's not just an invitation to Jesus. It also is our invitation. Our needs in our lives are invitations for Jesus to participate. But it's also an invitation to know Jesus better. The needs in your life are invitations, opportunities for you to know Jesus better. And with that mindset, I think we can appreciate needs instead of complain about them and get discouraged with them and resent them. I wish I didn't have, you know, family, if we see these as opportunities, I'm on the road to relating and all these needs are opportunities for me to know Jesus better and to become a stronger, deeper relator. So with that in mind, Mary says, hey, they've run out of wine. Now, 
initially I would think, that's not, not that big a deal. It's embarrassing, like, if you're hosting a party and you run out of food, you know, you send somebody to Walmart and grab a couple bags of chips. Maybe that's how that plays. But in this situation, culture time, I read some of the theologians and all that, and they said it's possible. There was a, an expectation, culturally, there was an expectation that if you came to a wedding feast, you, you expected to be hosted well to have provisions, food, wine, whatever. And if they ran out in this time in history, it was possible for there to be legal recourse that the guests, I know, right? I had the same reaction. I was like, what? Who does that? Who would, who would take to court somebody who didn't prepare adequate? Like, that, that's just crazy. But that could be some of the motive with Mary. Hey, they've run out of wine. And it's interesting because Jesus replied to her in verse 4. He says to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? I always think, you know, I read, I don't know how many commentaries on this. And all the commentators... I'm just going to be really honest and take it up for whatever you want to read. All of them are male, and they're all trying to make it sound like it wasn't offensive. <laughs> Woman. I'm like, where's the female commentators that would have some input on that? Because I'm not reading it right. I'm like, seriously. If one of my boys said to me, Woman? Yeah, you, that's exactly right. <laughs> it wouldn't last for long at all. But woman, what does that? And here's what I want to point this out to you. as a little bit of humor, but I think it's really fun. And it's interesting because he says, what does that have to do with us? And my question is, who is us? Who is us? Because if you remember, he's over here talking with his mom, with Mary. Is he saying, woman, <laughs> what does that have to do with you and me, with us? Because if that's true, if it's with his mom, this, and he says it, my time has not yet come. Then it's a shift in the time, the season, what's happening. And he's telling her, hey, mom, <laughs> woman, we're making some adjustments here. And I'm moving into more of a public demonstration, public ministry. But I also would say this. When Jesus says to a woman, what does it have to do with us? It could also be Jesus with us, the new followers. Right? Andrew, Peter, Nathaniel, Philip. With us. They've run out of wine. What's the big deal for us? But I want to point this out. Because whether it's with Mary, us, or whether it's with new disciples, us, the invitation is for us. All of us in the room. All of us online. Us. We are included. Jesus doesn't say to her, What's that have to do with you? What's it have to do with them? With, when we have a need in our lives, it gets to be us because we invite Jesus to participate in the need. And I love that when we see needs as invitations for Jesus, we see needs as a way, as a path, as the journey toward growing in greater and greater relationship. And so what Mary does, and I, I, I think what she does is very, again, it's instructional. You've got these new followers over here. And in some respects, I feel like a new follower, really, legitimately. Because I'm always like, wow, that just blew my mind. It opens my eyes. I can't believe it. So when I watch Mary, and I see and I recognize she's pretty dialed in in her relationship, right, with Jesus. I mean, she knows this guy soup to nuts. And I watch what she does. I watch what she says. She models for me. She models for each of us uh, what that relationship, how to grow, and what it looks like in that depth, in that intimacy, in that connection, in that family engagement. And when I watch her, I see that she's instructional. And maybe that's also part of Jesus' intention with his followers, these new guys, is she, he knows, hey, they don't know me as well as she does, 
But the way she acts, what she says, will help you grow and have a deeper relationship, deeper connection with Jesus, because you'll become increasingly more aware of who he is, what he does, what his goals are, what his heart is, which is totally, she knows, and they are learning. And I think it's relevant for all of us in the room. Mary knew, but we can watch and learn and grow as well by what she does. She models for us. So what is it that she does? And this is what she says. First and foremost, I, say, I would say this. Relators have honest conversations with Jesus. And you may not like what you hear. <laughs> Woman, I'm not going to like what I hear. You, you start off that way, and I'm about ready to pack up my toys and go home. But I appreciate that it's honest. And at this point, she doesn't get offended. She doesn't walk away. How dare I brought you into this room. I could take you out. She doesn't do any of that. It's an honest conversation. She could be offended. And there have been times and seasons in your life, my life, when I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus, that I have been offended. I've been mad. I've been frustrated. I've been angry. But it didn't prevent an ongoing conversation. I kept talking. I didn't understand it all. I was cranky and pouty and sulky and, but I still showed up. It's okay. I don't have to understand everything to show up and still engage. And so this is what she says. It's an honest conversation. But then what she, what she does after this is verse five. She says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now, I think that's instructional in two ways. Number one, the guy is carrying out the instructions. But it's also instructional to the new followers as well. And it's instructional to us. Because sometimes what Jesus tells you to do is not going to make sense. It's not going to compute in your mind. It's going to be illogical. That doesn't seem to be cohesive. But Jesus, no matter what he tells you to do, do it. And so he tells, <laughs> he tells the servants, you got six water pots here. And those of us who went to Israel, remember two years ago, right? Two years ago this month. We saw those water pots. Remember how tall those are, Lisa? Like up to here, right? Those are huge water pots. Big, and there's like six of them. So they fill them up to the rim. And Jesus says, take some of that with, from the water that you poured in there. <laughs> and go give it to the master head of ceremonies. So if you're the servant and you're, he tells you to do that, how many of you know this would be some of your mental narrative? You want me to do what? That's so stupid. It's water, you idiot. And the master, this is embarrassing. You know, if I take that, he's going to spit it out in my face. I'm going to look like an idiot. They're going to probably ostracize me. I might get punished, you know. This is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. That's completely illogical. Would that be any of your mental narrative? And be totally my mental narrative. And how about those new relators, the new followers? <laughs> uh, uh. And I think that's an accurate reaction for a lot of us. We're new followers with Jesus. We don't understand it all. Turn the other cheek. Someone spits at you. Someone's mean to you. Someone's hateful to you. Be nice to those who persecute. No, that's not logical. They need to get paid back for it. I mean, some of that stuff that Jesus tells us, it's, it doesn't make sense. Nevertheless, do it. <laughs> Don't let your brain and your flesh and your emotions control your obedience. Come on, family. That's worth the price of admission right there. So they do it. And I like what happens here. <laughs> because when they do it, the master of the feast, and I like this. I don't care how you want to read it. Basically, the master of the feast says, wow, this is amazing wine. And normally, at these kinds of parties, you serve the expensive wine first so that when everybody's less aware, <laughs> wink, wink, <laughs> you can whip out the cheap stuff and they're not going to know the difference. You tracking with me? That's the religious reverent way to say sloshed. Anyways, that's whatever. But the master of the feast says this. And I love, this is an observation. I think it's really important. You know, 
this wine that you've given us now is far better than anything you gave us before. And what happens is when we see a need in our lives, the need, the needs that we have are invitations. And when Jesus, when we invite Jesus, Lord, I need you. I need you in this moment. I need you in this situation. I need you. I need you. When we see that need and we invite Jesus to participate in that need, appreciate that both the quantity and the quality of the provision will exceed anything in your natural abilities. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to go further in that road to relating, then let's see the needs in our lives as springboards as launching pads, as invitations. Because I guarantee you that these new guys, <laughs> when they watched how this all unfolded, the conversation with his mom, what his mom responded, how she reacted, what she did, what the servants did, I think there was a marked change in these new followers with some pretty wide eyes like, oh my gosh, <laughs> look at what this guy can do. We had no idea. And so my point in this is, let's see the needs. Let's not see needs just for, for the face value. Let's see needs as Jesus' invitation, inviting Jesus to participate, to engage. And in that resolution, in that journey, that we know Jesus more and more and more and more. I read it this morning in Galatians 4.19, the last part of that verse, it says, um, Paul talks about how he labors till Christ be formed in you. And ultimately what we want is we want to have such a close relationship and connection with Jesus that people can't tell the difference. That Jesus oozes out of us. His compassion, his love, his consistency, his faithfulness, his truth, miracles, all of who he is, sacrifice, all of Jesus, and John said it, John 3, verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. But that's the ro road that we're on, is relating. Whether we're new in the, in the journey, kind of in the middle of it, maybe we're getting closer to being like Mary, his mom, but all of us can grow and have a deeper relationship and connection, relationship with Jesus. So I'd, I'd like to finish with these couple takeaways for you. And then I invited Pastor Bree. I want to finish with this song, Lord, I Need You. Lord, I Need You. Such a powerful song and so true for our human existence. But for some takeaways here, if you look up on the screen, you might want to shoot a picture of these. I would say this. Invite Jesus to participate in your needs. It might be the need for patience on the highway because the jerk is driving the same, same um, speed as the other guy, too slow, and you're behind, you know. What are the needs? I need rent money. I need help on a decision. I need patience. I need wisdom. I need strength in my soul. Those are invitations for Jesus. And then being us with Jesus, what is that to us? Jesus is connected. He's intentionally connecting with us. Let's not refuse that connection. Let's not see us and them, him disconnected and detached, Jesus over there. Let's be part of us and us including the needs that we have. And then I would also say this, recognize that Jesus, and I always, I love saying this, Jesus has more answers than we have questions. Jesus has more provisions than we have needs. Jesus has more solutions than we have problems. We're on the road to relating. And this isn't just in theory. This is something that we can experience. That Jesus has answers, solutions, and provision. I like this too, timing. Timing is an important deal. And he accentuated that in his conversation with Mary. My time. My time is not yet. Let's allow Jesus' timing to resolve the needs. 
I think we live so much by our clocks, by our calendars, by the days of the week, hours of the day, boom, boom, on a deadline. I'm on a deadline. I got to get it done. But let's appreciate that he's the author of time. He lives outside of time and he knows the timelines. And let's acknowledge that Jesus is the perfect um, scheduler. (laughs) You don't have to schedule. You can't schedule better than Jesus. And then let Jesus determine how. How is Jesus going to fix this? How is Jesus going to answer? How is Jesus? And Mary didn't tell him, you need to do some kind of magic wand thing. Mary left the the method up to Jesus. How? How is Jesus going to resolve it? I don't know. But if you don't invite him, then you'll never have the opportunity to figure out to go in that journey in the first place. Let Jesus determine how. And then make decisions to follow Jesus no matter what he says. And then this is the last verse I want you to get. In verse 12, it says this. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, his disciples, they stayed there a few days. And just before that, in verse 11, it says, his disciples believed in him. Mary already believed in him. But the disciples were on the journey And from this experience, their belief and faith in him grew. And so that's our invitation, is that we can let the needs in our lives be opportunities for us to know Jesus better and to increase our belief in him. So I just ask you to stand to your feet today. I want us to sing this song, Lord, I need you. Because we don't, we don't, honestly, family, we don't need money more than we need Jesus. We don't need wisdom more than we need Jesus. Jesus is Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. No matter what the needs are, we need Jesus. More than anything, we need Jesus. So I'd invite you, Pastor Bree's gonna lead us in this and then we'll finish the service. we need you we acknowledge recognize that we need you we need you today we need you this hour we need you this week we need you in circumstances in situations in relationships in our souls Jesus we need you and we thank you that you're everything that we need I pray Holy Spirit that you would remind us Remind us of this. When we get distracted by what seems like a need, let it remind us to come to Jesus. 
to find our, our solace, our comfort, our source in Jesus. Thank you for helping us and reminding us of your love and our growing relationship with you in Jesus' name. As we finish, I want to um, minister. I asked Holy Spirit uh, some uh, a thing to pray on. And I just want to, how many of you are making decisions? You have some decisions that you need to make, um, and they're important decisions for you. Just if you keep your hand up, I want to, everybody that's around them, just stretch out your hand to those individuals. And come, make sure you get some people behind you as well. We've got people in the back and the front here. And I just pray for each person online that name, names you, go ahead and put in the chat there, right there. We want to pray that God would direct you in these decisions. Father, I thank you for Isaiah 30, 21, that every person who has their hand raised, each person online making decisions, that you, we would hear a voice behind us saying, go to the right, go to the left. There would be clarity. I rebuke confusion, anxiety, and worry and fear that we don't hear well and doubt. I thank you, Jesus, we are your sheep and the voice of a stranger. We don't follow. The stranger's voice repels us. We run away, we flee because we know Jesus' voice. And I thank you, Jesus, that we hear you clearly well and we rest and trust that you're leading and guiding us. We invite you into these decisions and thank you ahead of time for the clarity for directing us and guiding us in Jesus' name. Thank you for doing this. Amen. All right, friends and family, super glad you're here. We have a prayer team that's available. If you have specific needs, we'd love to pray for you. They're here at the front. Um, remember Wednesday, watch online. It's great. The women's charcuterie board thing on Friday night. I always want to say cockroaches, but it's not really what it is. I know that sounds weird, but we love your guts. Remember, every need is an invitation to know Jesus better. Have a great week. Catch you later.